when you start a business, you have to be prepared to be like water. And that requires resilience and dedication and focus. Hi, everyone. It's Kara Golden from The Kara Golden Show. And I am so thrilled to have my next guest here. We have Nicole Eccles, who is the founder and CEO of an amazing, amazing company, an amazing product, uh, Glasshouse Fragrances. And uh, we are so excited to have her here today to talk a little bit more about her company, how it started, how it's going, all of that kind of stuff. Um, in 2005, uh, she decided to uproot her life and head to Australia. And that is when the idea for Glasshouse Fragrances started. Um, she is an incredible example of finding your passion, um, basically walking every day in life and, uh, and, you know, being open to figuring out, is there a business somewhere in here? And, uh, I've loved doing the research on her and really understanding a little bit of the background of the company before actually trying her amazing, amazing product that is, uh, actually a candle that is all natural fragrances, but also just native scents of Australia. Um, I actually had a flower scent that is just unbelievable. So I am so excited to hear more about her journey and welcome Nicole. Hi, thank you for having me. It's so nice to talk to you. I'm a big fan of what you do and I love talking to other entrepreneurs. Oh, amazing. Well, thank you. So you started Glasshouse Fragrances after moving to Australia, I read. Yes. I mean, it yes. sounds like a fun journey um, to make that decision. I bet it wasn't an easy one, um, maybe initially, but tell me a little bit about the early days. Like what led you to do that? My background is cosmetics. I was working, you know, I'm from the New York City area. I was working at Saks Fifth Avenue uh, for Chanel for many years. And I left that business and went into corporate sales. And I worked uh, for a company that relocated me to California and I lost my job. My son and I had moved over there. I didn't know anyone in California. I was living not too far from where you are in Sausalito. And I lost my job and I thought, oh, geez, what am I going to do now? Like my friends threw me a going away party in New York and I gave up my apartment. And anyone who's from New York knows that's like a big deal trying to find a new one. So I decided I was going to keep going. And I went to Sydney because a friend of mine said, oh, you're really going to love, you know, Sydney. So just why don't you go over there? I said, OK, I'll go over to Sydney and see what it's like. So I put my son it was it was a summer break. And my mom took my son, Gregory, and watched him. And then I went over there and I thought, this is a beautiful place. This will be a great place to raise a child. And the other main thing that happened was I saw a gap in the market, a massive bleeding gap. And I thought, I know I've been looking for a very long time for a gap in the U.S. market, and I haven't been able to identify one, but there is a big one here, and I'm going to go for it. So that was kind of the reason that I decided to move there. I loved it, but I could have just stayed on a vacation and come home, but I decided to stay. And you started Glasshouse Fragrances all that. I mean, all those years ago, it's nearly 16 years now. We started Hint the same year. Uh, so it's, yes. uh, I'm thinking back on that time. But you had, but you had not, you worked at Chanel how did you know how to do this? I mean, it's such a big uh, well, I deal. Did. I didn't. I didn't even know how. So we started. So we own the scented candle category in Australia. We are the biggest. We are a household name. And everyone Amazing. who's Australian, if you say Glasshouse Fragrances, not only do they know the brand, they're probably using in the brand. And we're a lifestyle fragrance company. So we do candles, which was the first thing product that I created. But we also do personal care, eau de parfum. There's lots of products that we make. We have over 100 SKUs in our core range. So I didn't know how to do any of this. But as a consumer, I knew exactly what I wanted. And I had come from arguably the biggest beauty market in the world. Mm -hmm. And I moved to Australia where it's one of the tiniest. And it, it just felt to me like, geez, where's all the products? And so... I didn't know how to make a candle and candle making is incredibly hard. Yeah. And I didn't know that either. And, and here in the States, 
uh, most companies, if you want to start a candle business, you can go to a contract manufacturer. You can make these products. There are plenty of beautiful contract manufacturers around there. But in Australia, there weren't any. Hmm. So I had to create my own factories. And that makes us very, very unique in this industry because we make everything ourselves by hand, which means I can control the rhythm in terms of newness because I'm not a slave to MOQs. I can control the quality. It takes us 18 months for a product, just we call it concept to customer, an idea till actually it's launched into the market because we're so pedantic about quality. That's how long it takes to, to get the fragrance to work, to get the adhesion on the glass, to, to get the fragrance to burn evenly and cleanly all the way to the bottom. That's amazing. And it took, I would say it wasn't until about five years ago that I was truly satisfied with our product. And now it is world-class yeah. for the price point. It's true. For the price point, you cannot buy anything as good. Well, I'm a, a candle snob. Uh, so when I got your candle, I um, not only loved the essence that was um, that I was smelling, the fragrance that I was smelling, but also the, how much it lasts, right? And it's, I mean, that is such, you know, you can tell quality, I, th I think, from that. Well, that's the thing. When I started this brand, I thought, okay, what do I want in a candle? I wanted it to be strong. So they're triple scented. I wanted the jar to be unobjectionable, to go in any decor and look beautiful. I wanted it to smell really expensive. I wanted the fragrances to be complex, lasting, bold, and full, all of these things. And when I when I, I, I used to reference little, all these different things. So I'd say, I want it to be as big as a Yankee candle, but I want it to be as luxurious as the high end brands. And I used to sort of think about all these attributes. And what happened was I created this, this candle that was the best of the best. And after that, pretty much every brand tried to come into Australia because the category was in fast growth at this point. And there were a lot of, competitors coming into the market. But because we, the price was great, we have a huge range of fragrances. It's unobjectionable to look at. It's not a huge market also compared to other places. There just really wasn't anywhere to go. And so we're very fortunate to, um, to be uh, as, as established and as big as we are, but we don't take it for granted. We are pushing ourselves every day to, to stay ahead to break the boundaries in our industry to do things that are innovative and different to keep our customers happy. Going back to the first couple of years, what what were the, like the key things that you, I, I mean, maybe lessons learned uh, while you're sitting there trying to build out this company? I would imagine to some extent you're you had a little candle operation going in your home, test, doing some testing. And, uh, and you know, tell me, like, those first couple of years, like, how did you even know how to get this I thing off the ground? No idea. I just knew what I wanted the end result to be. And I remember I didn't know how to make a candle. So I was in Australia a lot. They have a lot of, like, weekend markets where people will sell, like, coffee and home-baked bread. So, yeah, they do here, too, as, sure. as well. And there was a candle maker there that used to pour, you know, sometimes candle makers, those market home types mm -hmm. will pour candles in anything, wine jugs, you know, teacups. So I met this guy there. I go, oh, you look like you know how to make a candle. Why don't you come over to my kitchen and we'll make it together and show me how to make this candle. And I remember we're making these candles and I couldn't smell anything because there was so, this I know now. But there was so much fragrance in the room that I had become completely numb to the fragrance and the set, the smell of it. My olfactory shut down. And I remember saying to him, these candles aren't strong enough. We need to put more fragrance in them. We need to put more fragrance with them. And he said, Nicole, we have so much fragrance in these candles. Someone's going to fall over when they burn these. They are, they're as loaded as they get. And then I remember... Um, they used to smoke so bad because I didn't know how to burn ah, hair wigs. Yeah. And they were terrible, terrible. If I had started this business in the U.S., I, I surely would have been 
you know, done before I started. But in that market, consumers didn't really know what a scented candle should or shouldn't do. So they just used to trim the heck out of them to keep them from smoking. Yeah. So I, was like, I have to fix this. So that's how we ended up with two wicks in our candle instead of the one, because I couldn't get it. I couldn't find a wick that worked. So I put two in there and it's one of our sort of, you know, our, our signature. sort of signatures. Yeah. Now. I, I love that. And so did you obviously not direct to consumer back in 2005, I would guess, uh, especially not in Australia. So no. you were going straight to retail initially. What was your first store that you went into? What I did was um, we're privately owned and my partner who I had met, who was the investor in the brand, um, I said, look, um, we'll make this, these first batches ourselves before we open a factory and then let's make sure this works before we invest in a facility in staff, et cetera, et cetera. So I made about 300 candles and we had 12 boutiques around Sydney. Um, when I say boutiques, independent, beautiful retailers with the, you know, lovely, beautiful clothes or homewares or gifts, those sort of places. And um, I just brought the candles to them. I said, you don't have to pay me. I just want you to put them out and let's see, you know, if you sell them, you can pay me, but let's see how they go. And each store would have had about 24 pieces or something like that. Everyone sold out in like three days. Amazing. And I picked the best shops I could find, which I didn't know because I just moved there. Yeah. Yeah. So I had to read all, I was reading all the magazines and what would happen is the stylists would take, you know, a sculpture from this shop or flowers from this shop. And, but they were all the trendy it stores. So I went to those stores because I knew that at least they had a reputation for being beautiful. And, and that's the only way I could do it because I didn't know, and I didn't know any shops or anything. I just, I felt my way through it, Tara, felt my way through it because I didn't know when you don't yeah. know, you have to feel your way. So interesting. So what, what is the toughest business decision that you've learned along the way? I mean, maybe there was, I mean, you talked about the wicks a little bit, but what, was there something like, I've had people on before who talked about pricing or, uh, doing a factory, not doing a factory. I mean, Seth Goldman from honest, uh, we just recorded his and, you know, you talked about, he had factories and that was like a nightmare. For him, like it wasn't the business that he wanted to be in. And so there's so many lessons that oh. I think people don't see. Uh, what do you think is like one of the biggest lessons that you've learned? We could talk all day like you. We've been doing this a while. We could talk all day about this. But I, you know, the, the toughest thing I think in business is when you don't know and there's sort of two roads you can take and you actually don't have a preference for one or the other, or don't think one is better than the other, but you have to make a decision. And a good example of that is we just doubled our factory recently during COVID when in our category, home fragrance has been in 30% growth globally. Um, we, our business was no different. We experienced great growth during that time, but we didn't know if that growth would continue because people returning back to work, going back to the office, we knew that the base would be higher than it was before. And we knew with current production and requirements, we, we had run out of space. The other thing that was happening is simultaneously is we were expanding here into the U.S., which is why I've moved back after all these years to be with my family, which I, I, and I've missed the U.S. so much, to be honest. But also I'm here to sort of had this expansion. And I said, well, what if it doesn't work? Like, what if, you know, what if I'm not, and, and I, and I, you know what, it is going to work. Of course it is. We've had great results so far, but taking on and doubling your factory is a massive expense. Totally. Yeah. And it's uh, a massive expense. And also you're going into a market that is more crowded, right? And, and, and there goes your EBIT. There goes yeah. your EBIT. And you're like, okay, well, what do I do? And so anyway, so we did it. And that's one example, but there's so many. I think the toughest thing in business for me has been um, understanding people are the most important part of any business. Uh -huh. And when you get that wrong, it causes a lot of problems. And, you know, having good leaders in the right roles and 
keeping everyone motivated and um, on track, that is really my job. Yeah. In addition to creating fragrances and coming up with product ideas. And that's, you know, that's the hard, I think the hardest part in, in business, but we have a fantastic team. Like I yeah. wouldn't here if it wasn't for those guys, but getting that right. I had to learn, I learned that the hard way over time and ex- with experience. Yeah. I, I think that that's one lesson that I've learned as well. I remember the first time, uh, we had somebody quit and, uh, it, you know, in the early days and I, I took it very personally, you know, and <laughs> it, right. And it was just, it was very much about, uh, why didn't I see it coming? I mean, what, how can I, um, what can I do differently? And what I learned over time and I share with entrepreneurs and other leaders is that it's, um, you know, it's, there's different stages of companies, um, for different people. Right. And you have to let them fly, right. You have to let them go and, and go find something else. And I think that it's definitely, but especially when it's your first company, um, you just have a different lens to it than maybe when you were working for somebody else. Right. And, and I think it's just a, uh, it's just a very, very interesting sort of learnings. Again, there's a lot of things that as a founder and a CEO that are, of course you have had to do that you don't talk about, right? Like, you know, figuring out health insurance or figure, you know, all these different things that you've got to do that above and beyond making an incredible product. And yes, yes. When you start, you have to be very dynamic and our culture is, it's a family. It feels like a family business and I try to, as we scale, that's been the most challenging part. That's so important to me that everyone, I used to cry when people left. I used to, it felt like I was breaking up with like, you know, it was so hard. And now I, if someone leaves the company because they've been promoted to a better role or recruited somewhere else, I'm happy for them. And I'm glad part of that journey. So during COVID, you were in Australia? Uh, yes. And, and so, part of it, and part of it here, I sort of, I moved here in late 2020. So interesting. So what was it like for you in Australia? Because you guys, I mean, Australia had an extensive oh. lockdown and it was, uh, you know, in terms of the factories and I'm, I'm so curious. Well, um, yeah, it, it was tough when COVID first started because we had it before the U S because it was sort of China. Yeah. It, it, Australasia, then it's sort of, and I remember calling my brother who lives in Jersey city. And I said, cause I heard there was one case in uh, the U S and I called to him. I said, Jonathan, I'm going to say something to you right now. And you're going to think I'm nuts, but you need to go to the grocery store right now. And you need to buy toilet paper. These are the things you need to buy. And he said, Oh, don't be ridiculous. Nicole. Yeah. And so when in Australia, you know, the culture is very different. They're culturally more obedient in, mm-hmm. in general, um, more cooperative. And the view of, you know, Australia and New Zealand was similar. And that is let's just zero cases. Let's just not, no one yeah. should get it. And yeah. everyone just stays stuck inside. You know, those people that move around the world for weather, I feel like I've moved around the world for COVID because I was like, I, I get out of here. So I did one month shut in the house. That's not for me. I could not cope. Yeah. I feel so bad for my fellow Australians that had to go through that. And when I moved back here, that was when the really bad, so Melbourne and Victoria had a lot of really bad lockdowns, like months and months. They couldn't leave. They could not leave their neighborhood, their house. And you were Um, in Sydney. I was in Sydney, but last year, Sydney had an extensive lockdown for a few months where everyone was in the house and I was here and it was such a culture shock to come from Australia and then come here where everyone's walking around doing whatever, everyone's catching COVID passing it along. It was so different. And how about your factories? How, how was Um, that? Well, the factory, um, we kept running. Uh We were very careful. We had separate shifts that ran. We had the office area shot from the, um, the manufacturing area. We were, we were so afraid that someone, one of our candle makers or someone in manufacturing was going to um, have COVID because if we did, then we would have had to shut down. Sure. And one of the most incredible things, because a lot of our uh, people in this industry, 
this, when you, when your business increases by 30%, you have to be prepared for that. Yeah. You have to yeah. have the raw materials, for example, to make the products. Yeah. We had that because we had just gone through a period where we decided we made a strategic decision to really bulk up because there were advantages to the FX exchange. There were reasons for it. And so we suddenly had all of this stuff. We didn't miss a single sale during COVID. And that is in our industry. That is. That's amazing. Amazing. And it's because of my amazing ops director. She did the most incredible job making sure that our employees were safe, Mm -hmm. that the place was, we, we tripled our cleaning regime. So we did, we got through it. We did what we needed to do. Team is everything. So, but it's, uh, I love hearing these stories of, you know, resilience. No, I don't think anybody was prepared no matter where you were in the world and you, you know, the real leaders, the real, um, you know, incredible managers were the ones that just sort of stepped up to the plate in every industry. So I I love hearing these stories for sure. So what do you think now that you're in the U.S. and you're building this company? I feel like you've done something. You've sort of inserted yourself into um, the chaos again, right, of building up a new company because you have to get people to know the brand, all, all of these things. You started a new factory, as you talked about. Is everything in the U.S.? Are you importing or... No, oh, so we make everything in Sydney in the factory. Okay. And then I sent, and it's sent to uh, the U.S., and we have a 3PL in Dallas where we ship the product from. Awesome. So, yeah, that's what we're doing for now. And then as we grow, we can revisit that to see if that still makes sense. And where are you available in the U.S. right now? So Neiman Marcus. We just launched ne- Neiman Marcus um, and Bloomingdale's. And we are on sex.com. We'll be in Von Moore, which is a middle is a Midwest uh, beautiful department store uh, in the second half. And we have an Amazon store and our dot com, of course, our glasshouse fragrances dot com. Which store. is great. What what lessons would you share with people who are just thinking about starting a business and and uh what did you not know going into this? Um, you know, obviously had many lessons, but what what kind of things would you share with people? Be sure you. Be sure that you are, you have to be like water when you're in business, don't you? You have to, water is the one thing that always finds a way in, over, around, and through. And when you start a business, you have to be prepared to be like water and that requires resilience and dedication and focus. Um, because if you have a good idea and there's a market for what you are doing, then you can make it work, but it doesn't happen overnight and it's hard work. It's bloody hard work and you have to love it. You have to love it because if you don't love it, now that's a Steve jobs phrase. If you don't love it, then you're not going to stick to it because it's hard. It's hard. You remind me a lot of Greg Renfrew from Beauty Counter. I had her on Mm -hmm. at one point and, you know, she, she also said it takes a lot longer. It always, I mean, everything takes longer. Right. And when we, when I see decks and plans that are like, oh, we're going to flip this in two years and, you know, it's going to be great. It's just it's so unrealistic. Everything always takes longer. And, uh, and especially if you want to build a brand that is here to stay. And they say, you know, an overnight success is 10 years. Yeah, absolutely. So it's, uh, I, I totally agree, but you remind me a lot of her and, uh, sort of doing it for all the right reasons. And, and, um, it's so, so incredible. So, uh, you mentioned the stores, you mentioned where people find it on it online. Where's the best place for people to stay connected to you and your story? Our Instagram site's great. And also my personal Instagram, uh, Nicole Eccles, uh, and also, and then Glasshouse Fragrances. So we have two handles, which makes our business a little complex, but because Australia's opposite seasons, summer, for example, is launching in Australia in January, de- December, January, and here we're launching in June. So we get the season happens first in Australia and then it gets shipped over and then it arrives here, which is good for us from a logistics point of view, you know, but that's why we have two Instagram handles. 
Oh, that's so interesting. So is can are candles really seasonal? I mean, I guess, you know, for the for the holidays, for the Christmas holidays, I would imagine yeah. there's but are there certain things that are year round? So we do have year round, of course, but we operate what makes us a little different is we operate like a fashion business. So we are trend based. We're always ahead of fragrance trends, what's happening. And we pulse our brand exactly like fashion. So we have summer collections, winter collections. We have, and then it's sort of a hybrid with more of a homewares kind of a brand where we have Mother's Day and we have Christmas. And then we have a retail pop moment at Harvest where we do like a pumpkin, you know, scented fragrance. So we, we, we're sort of a hybrid between fashion meets homewares. And because I believe that your power of smell is your most powerful one of all. And our customers are junkies. They love fragrance and lots of it. So they, we need to feed them newness all the time. And that's why we have so many animations and so many launches and campaigns throughout our year. So interesting. So I never really thought about that. Is that unique to your brand? Do you think, do you it feel is. like, yeah, I, I do too. I, it's so super, super interesting. Well, this is so incredible. You've got my head spinning right now around this industry that is, uh, um, I'm a huge consumer, but I don't know a ton about it. And so I, I loved not only your entrepreneurial lessons, but also your backstory and finding something that you're really interested in doing every single day, which I'm such a huge proponent of, but um, also just you're incredibly inspiring. So thank you so much thank for, you. and good luck with launching in the U.S. Everybody needs to go buy uh, Glass House. It's um it, like I said, really, really great. And you you will not be sorry. So thank you so much, <laughs> Nicole. And yeah. thanks everybody for listening. We are here every Monday, Wednesday, and now Friday. Please subscribe. So you be sure to be able to listen to incredible stories like Nicole and Glass Houses and learn about not only new products, new companies, um, existing companies that are doing incredible things that have great founders and CEOs. And as I mentioned, we are here every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, uh, interviewing incredible people. So thanks everyone for listening and have a great rest of the week.